Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. Before we get started, we have a favor to ask you, our listeners. We're so thankful for all your support, and we want to hear from you about what you think of the show. So we've created a short two-minute survey that you can fill out by clicking on the link in the show notes or by going to taxnotes.com slash podcast survey. We look forward to hearing from you. This week, trials and tabulations. Periodically, we like to take a look at the state of transfer pricing litigation here in the U.S. And since our previous episode on the subject last year, there have been two major decisions. Eden and Medtronic cover two vastly different areas, but continue to develop the new landscape where rather than routine IRS losses, we're seeing much more mixed results. In a moment, I'll be joined by Tax Notes contributing editor Ryan Finley to talk more about this. Later in the episode, we'll hear from Tax Notes international author Fernanda Katsias about the article she co-wrote on the Brazil-U.S. trade agreement. But first, Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So since the last time you were here, I understand there have been two major decisions. Could you tell us about them? Yeah, two major decisions in particular. The first is the Medtronic II opinion, which the tax court issued in August. It's the decision that comes after the case was remanded by the Eighth Circuit in 2018, which came after the tax court decided the case uh, largely in Medtronic's favor in 2016. The other one is later in August has to do with the Eaton case which uh, has to do with APAs and cancellation. And that case was decided by the Sixth Circuit, and it basically affirmed the tax court opinion from 2017. All right, why don't we go in uh, reverse chronological order, and let's dive into the Eaton case first. First of all, could you give some background on the company? Sure. So Eaton Corporation is a U.S.-based multinational that manufactures sort of electrical equipment, you know, devices that have to do with power management. Uh, and they manufactured some of these devices at offshore plants in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. And it was those transactions that were the subject of the APA at issue in the case. And what was the main issue going to trial? So rather than kind of like the, the substantive analysis of whether these transactions were priced at arm's length, the main issue was whether the IRS was within its rights to cancel a pair of uh, advanced pricing agreements that it had entered into with Eaton Corporation. Basically, what happened was Eaton made a number of acknowledged and self-reported but major errors, basically in its compliance with with the terms of the APA and in its annual compliance reports that it had to release under the APA. On that basis, the IRS said that, you know, these were under the the relevant cancellation standards, which, you know, allow the IRS to cancel for material omissions of fact, material misrepresentations, basically whether the IRS had the right to cancel these APAs on the basis of these inadvertent but major errors. All right, taking one quick step back for anybody that may not be familiar, what are these advanced pricing agreements? Yeah, so an advanced pricing agreement is basically an audit and settlement before the fact uh, in transfer pricing. So companies that want to reach agreement on the transfer pricing, usually for complicated transactions beforehand to avoid, you know, an audit down the line, an exam and, and, um, you know, potentially significant exposure, they enter negotiations with the IRS basically to form a contract that stipulates here's how our transfer pricing is going to work. You know, there are compliance obligations, like I said, these annual reports, But generally speaking, that APA is binding on both parties. The taxpayer has to follow it, and the IRS has to respect what it agreed to, subject to these exceptions that allow cancellation or, in even more egregious situations, revocation. So what happened at the tax court when this case came up for trial? So in 2017, the tax court held that essentially that the errors could not satisfy the materiality standard laid out in these revenue procedures. So basically, there are two revenue procedures. One replaced the other that detailed you know, the whole APA process, compliance, negotiation, et cetera. And they set out these, you know, the standards for cancellation. Applying those standards, Judge Kathleen Kerrigan held that this kind of situation where you have a self-reported, self-corrected, but again, still major error in compliance, 
that those sorts of errors cannot satisfy the specific materiality standard that allows the IRS to cancel an APA. So basically, it was a win for Eaton. Importantly, the judge did side with the IRS on the standard of review. So on the one hand, the IRS said its decision to cancel the APA should be reviewed, kind of deferential abuse of discretion review, whereas, you know, Eaton wanted it to be looked at more as just sort of a, you know, a contract between equal parties, equally binding on both sides. And, and you know, cancellation would only be permitted to the extent that the contract allows it. All right. So then this case went up on appeal. And what happened at the uh, appeals court? Yeah. So technically, this was a cross appeal because there were some secondary issues involved regarding the uh, assessment of Section 6662 penalties, accuracy related penalties. But the main issue was this cancellation decision. And it was a clear cut win for Eden. Um, the Sixth Circuit held that basically, you know, based on parsing the language and the revenue procedures regarding cancellation, that the kind of noncompliance that the parties agreed had taken place would not fall within that standard of materiality. The uh, Sixth Circuit affirmed the outcome, but rejected the tax court's holding that the standard of review was for abuse of discretion. The Sixth Circuit said, no, this is just a contract. And it was up to the IRS to prove sort of affirmatively that under the contract, it had the right to cancel it. What sort of ramifications does this decision have going forward? Right. It is kind of an isolated case in that if you look at APA statistics, there are very, very few. It's a very small percentage that the IRS tries to cancel or revoke. So it probably does not affect a ton of taxpayers. But an appellate court's holding that essentially that the IRS is not going to be given much leeway in its decisions to cancel or revoke an APA could potentially make the IRS a little more wary of entering in APAs in the first place. I would note that the IRS is now working on a new revenue procedure governing APAs, and it's possible that you know its experience from this case will be reflected in the cancellation standards in the new uh, revenue procedure. On the other hand, it does kind of solidify the you know binding force of an APA for taxpayers. So in that sense, it could be pro-taxpayer that they could be more confident that courts will really strictly scrutinize any IRS decision to try to cancel the APA. Support for this podcast is provided by SafeSend. Now is the time to focus on firm preparation because same as last year is no longer working for your staff or clients. It's more important than ever to assess current firm processes and make improvements. The SafeSend suite automates manual labor-intensive tasks across the tax engagement from engagement letters and client organizers to assembly, delivery, and e-signing of tax packages, the SafeSend suite makes it easy. Automation is transforming how firms work. Schedule a demo at safesend.com to get started and smile knowing that you will be ready for next tax season. All right, so let's turn to the Medtronic decision. Uh, what happened? So a little background. This is obviously Medtronic 2, so the case has quite a history. Uh, I believe the the petition was filed in 2011, so uh, this case has been going on for quite a while. It's really representative of kind of this recurring battle between the IRS and taxpayers over the selection of a transfer pricing method, especially transactions that involve the transfer of intangibles uh, usually developed in the United States by a U.S. parent to what's usually a low-taxed offshore subsidiary. Taxpayers in, in Medtronic and cases like it tend to favor transactional methods like this method called the comparable uncontrolled transaction method or cut method, which, you know, for various reasons often yields a lower royalty rate for the licensor than what the IRS tends to prefer, which is the comparable profits method. And the comparable profits method, as a you know, generalizing, leaves the licensee in the offshore jurisdiction with you know, less of the total profit attributable to the control transaction. So taking a step back just real quickly, could you tell us about Medtronic as a company and what this transaction is about? Sure. So Medtronic's a very prominent U.S.-based medical device manufacturer, specifically implantable medical devices. 
They're best known for their cardiovascular implantable devices, pacemakers, things like that. They also have a significant implantable neurological device business. Those two business lines were what were issue in the case. The specific transaction that the case centered around was Medtronic U.S.'s license of basically all the IP necessary to manufacture um, these cardiological and neurological devices to a subsidiary that manufactured them in Puerto Rico. The license covered patents. Uh, it covered you know related kind of know-how and technology that would be necessary to successfully manufacture these devices uh, according to the standards that they have to meet for implantable uh, medical devices. Yeah, and so basically the case is about how what should the royalty rate be for MPROC was the name of this Puerto Rican manufacturing subsidiary. What royalty should it pay Medtronic US for the right to use these intangibles to manufacture these devices? All right, and you mentioned that this has been going on since 2011. What has happened in the case over the last 11 years? Right. Well, the first court opinion uh, was in 2016 by the tax court. It was uh, an opinion also written by Judge Kathleen Kerrigan. It did not entirely accept Medtronic's position, but on this core question of whether the cut method or the CPM was the best method, the court squarely sided with Medtronic. Judge Kerrigan, in, in her 2016 Medtronic 1 opinion, found that additional royalty rate adjustments uh, that, to raise that royalty were necessary, but substantially she held in favor of Medtronic. The IRS subsequently appealed the case, basically arguing that the transaction that Medtronic had used as a comparable in its cut method analysis was not a reliable comparable. There are too many differences, too many adjustments were necessary to try to bring it in line with the license to this MPROC subsidiary that the result was not reliable. And the, specifically, the, the IRS uh, claimed that the tax court had failed to really consider and apply the comparability standards that the you know, cut regulations stipulate. The Eighth Circuit agreed, and they vacated the tax court's decision and remanded the case, uh, basically saying, you know, we need more factual development you know, to review your decision that uh, you know, this comparable and the comparable was a was a license. It was actually a a litigation settlement agreement with Siemens Pacesetter Inc. from uh, a decade before the controlled license at issue. But there are numerous differences between that and the MPROC license. Essentially, the A Circuit, you know, directed the the tax court to make the factual findings necessary to determine whether this Pacesetter license was really a reliable comparable, and you know, to use basically as the reference point to price this MPROC license. And then um, after that, last year actually, in 2021, uh, the tax court held its Medtronic II trial. And that trial was, uh, you know, based on what the Eighth Circuit opinion said, it was focused on essentially a reassessment of which method was more reliable. But in particular, Judge Kerrigan was uh, especially interested in the possibility that comparability adjustments could kind of be tacked on to one of the party's methods to kind of, as she often said, sort of bridge the gap between, you know, the results of, of the, the two parties' methods. That was followed by, uh, you know, about a year of post-trial briefing in which the parties basically, in general, they stuck to their original positions that, you know, for Medtronic that the cut method was the best method for the IRS that the CPM was. But based on Judge Kerrigan's sort of invitation at the end of the, the Medtronic II trial to the, to the parties to propose an unspecified method, um, which is something that in some circumstances the regulations allow, and it's basically just a, a method that the regulations do not expressly acknowledge or describe, but you know, the, they offer that, that possibility that in some cases maybe a method that the regulations don't identify could be the best method. All right, so the rules allow for unspecified methods, and Medtronic is arguing for them. What did the court do with that? The court accepted the unspecified method proposed by Medtronic kind of as the framework for what it ultimately found to be the, the most reliable method. 
uh, but sort of tweaked the the quantitative parameters in a way that that materially affected the the outcome. Judge Kerrigan did accept that method sort of conceptually as the the foundation for you know how she decided Medtronic two. It's an interesting method. It sort of resembles the residual profit split method in that it sort of uses traditional comparables based transfer pricing methods in the first couple steps to give the parties, you know, a certain share of the system profit, as they call it, and then, you know, basically splits up what remains based on some allocation percentage. But that's sort of where the similarities end with the profit split method. As part of that, those steps, step one was basically to give to Medtronic US a royalty rate after adjustments that was drawn from this pay setter agreement. So it was the same license that was used as the basis for the cut method. But in this case, it was nominally the first step in the unspecified method. So Medtronic gets the royalties that were determined using uh, rather the royalty rates for uh, the pay setter agreement subject to upward adjustments, but not including any adjustment for profit potential because that was addressed in a later step. The second step gave MPROC a return based on uh, the CPM, sort of kind of a nod to what the IRS thought ought to be done. Whereas Medtronic proposed splitting that remaining pot in uh, more favorable percentages for MPROC, Judge Kerrigan held that the most reasonable split of that remaining profit pool was 80% to Medtronic US and 20 to MPROC. It's important to not get sort of lost in the steps here that this really is, in essence, the cut method because it starts with the royalty rate drawn from a comparable uncontrolled transaction. It's just that this sort of more Byzantine and indirect way of calculating adjustments is not something that would ever be permitted under the actual cut method regulations. So it it raises the issue of whether this was just a, a non-compliant application of the cut method or if it really was, in fact, an unspecified method. Well, I'm, I'm curious about this issue of unspecified methods. So the regulations have set out certain ways that you're supposed to divvy up profits between entities, but then they have this one odd section of, I guess, make something up. How is that supposed to work? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and, and it's something that really... It hasn't been tested a whole lot in litigation under the current regulatory scheme. There's a a subsection of the regulations dealing with controlled intangible transfers that says that taxpayers can apply methods other than the specified methods, one of which is the cut method, um, another of which is the CPM. They can apply an unspecified method subject to two conditions, really. The first is that it really is the best method under the general kind of principles for identifying the best method. And the second, which is sort of built into the first, is that it complies with the realistic alternatives principle, which was something that was actually uh, added to the statute by the TCGA. But the realistic alternatives principle essentially says that for an unspecified method to be the best method, basically it can't leave one of the parties worse off than it would have been had the party engaged in a realistically available alternative transaction. So essentially, the the foregone profit or maybe the foregone uh, sales revenue that flowed from entering the control transaction serves as kind of the the baseline to measure the outcome of the unspecified method. Uh, There's an example in the regulations that the situation deals with um, a U.S. parent They license the IP necessary to manufacture an industrial adhesive to a foreign subsidiary, and they charge, you know, whatever, X as a royalty for the European subsidiary to to make that stuff and sell it in Europe. However, under the assumed facts, the U.S. parent would have earned far more than that royalty income had it just sold directly into the European market itself. That was its realistic alternative, and that was the foregone profit. And because that number is much greater than the the amount of royalty income that it was getting under the arrangement that it did enter, then that cannot have been an arm's length transfer price. So an unspecified method basically has to respect this sort of principle for evaluating 
you know, the, the arm's length nature of a, of a transfer price. So the court accepted Medtronic's basic method. So was this an unqualified win for Medtronic? Well, no, no, it was not an unqualified win. It's interesting. As I said before, Judge Kerrigan repeatedly expressed an intention or at least a, an aspiration to, to find a middle ground between the party's positions and the, the 80-20 split, which if there's some sort of substantive basis for that 80-20 split, um, there's no sign of it in the opinion. The 80-20 split that she found to be appropriate led to a royalty rate that fell very near the halfway point between the royalty rates that each party said were correct. So 11 years of litigation and we wound up just the average between the two? <laughs> well, you know, that's, uh, it, it's interesting. And the, there's language in the opinion preemptively denying that that's what was going on. You know, Judge Kerrigan said that, you know, she, she's not simply taking the average of, of two methods. She found that, you know, she, she, in her opinion, wrote that, you know, she thought that this, this method, this approach was overall sound and overall led to, to a reasonable outcome. Now, the changes she made, the dollar amount implications, you know, would significantly raise Medtronic's tax bill by hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, depending on how many tax years you're considering relative to the uh, original 2016 opinion. On the other hand, it was still considerably less than what the IRS said it ought to be. And it introduces this whole new kind of wrinkle in transfer pricing litigation of whether you can use this sort of catch-all unspecified method to kind of make up what you think gets you to your preconceived idea of an arm's length or reasonable outcome. Under the regulations, an unspecified method can't just be whatever gets you to, you know, the halfway point. It has to conform to these reliability and principles and the, and the realistic alternatives principle. And um, it's really not clear from the opinion whether that requirement was seriously taken into account uh, when Judge Kerrigan found that this was the right method. So it, it's it's kind of, in some sense, a loss for both parties. But I would say that I would caution that it is very possible that there will be a second appeal in this case. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say there probably will be just because of how important the legal issues are and how much uh, money is at stake in this case and in related cases that are ongoing. But for now, we can say that this case is not necessarily over. We don't really know who won yet because it could still be appealed. So, so what sort of danger is lurking out there for the IRS if it doesn't win on appeal? I mean, I think the greatest danger is that, you know, the IRS and Treasury wrote the cut method regulations in such a way, very strict, you know, comparability and reliability standards. And if you read through it, you know, the standards are far more explicit and prescriptive than what you'll find usually for other transfer pricing methods. And they did that on purpose because... You know, there's a ton of money at stake in these outbound IP transfers, and there's a high risk that really valuable, unique IP can be transferred for less than what it's worth by using unreliable transactional comparables. This raises the risk that taxpayers can pick and choose which of those cut method requirements they would like to follow, disregard others, and simply call it an unspecified method and in so doing, circumvent the requirements they don't like. As I said before, the later steps in the unspecified method accepted by the court really function as a profit potential adjustment. And in, in my view, the, the best reading of the regulations is that a significant difference in profit potential outright disqualifies an uncontrolled transaction as a comparable. It's simply not something that could be adjusted for. So if you look at this method as the cut method, simply trying to go under another name, then it's, it's something that's you know, pretty clearly at odds with the, with the regs. And the risk is that taxpayers would be able to sort of sidestep those by just renaming the method. Does this case have any direct implications on other cases in the pipeline? There are two trends and issues that I would highlight, and both of them are actually related to Medtronic. The first is the Amgen case, which is in early stages of litigation. But based on what appears in the, you know, the tax court petition and in Amgen's securities filings describing the situation, it's eerily similar to Medtronic. 
Um, there's a Puerto Rican manufacturing facility. They seem to be from the filings hinting at the selection of method. It really sounds like Medtronic 3, only the dollar amounts at stake are an order of magnitude greater. So it raises the stakes for you know any possible Medtronic appeal. The other case I'd mention is Coca-Cola. And you know this sort of came up in the post-trial briefing, whether the result in Coca-Cola requires the tax court's acceptance of the IRS's favored CPM uh, analysis in this case. In Coca-Cola, it was widely regarded as a major win for the IRS. They succeeded in getting the tax court to agree that the CPM and not other methods, including the cut method, you know, were the best method. Are there any other cases you're hoping to see a decision on in the near future? At one point, I was hoping to see uh, an opinion in, in the 3M case. I don't know whether hopes are warranted at this point, given that it's been fully briefed for six years. But you know, you never know. Uh, maybe at one point we'll get a 3M opinion. And if that were to happen, it would be a very big deal, not only in its own right, because of the blocked income issue it raises, but that very same issue that many taxpayers have it. And it's actually what's holding up Coca-Cola from proceeding into the appeal process, because the Coca-Cola opinion stayed that issue pending 3M. There's also the Perigo case that's been, you know, the trial's been held, it's been fully briefed, and we're waiting for uh, an opinion in that case at some point. And, you know, also, as I said, Amgen, cases that are sort of new incarnations of the cases we've seen, and Amgen is the best example of it, but there are, there are a handful of others as well. So a lot to look forward to. Yeah, and as we see these opinions, we'll have you come back and explain what they all mean. Brian, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Deborah Paul demonstrates what is unrealized about the tax treatment of partnership capital shifts. Ellen Buckley examines the litigation challenging the IRS's transformation of preparer tax identification numbers from simple identification numbers into licenses. In Tax Notes State, Nathan A. Strike and Stephen Gill examine the tax rules surrounding donations associated with access to sporting event tickets and college sports. David Gamage and Darren Shansky advocate for phased market-to-market -market for billionaire tax reforms. In Tax Notes International, Mindy Herzfeld summarizes the building blocks of Pillar 1 and warns taxpayers to pay more attention to it. Three KPMG practitioners argue that all the proposed alternatives to the arm's-length principle lack its two key benefits of neutrality and flexibility. In Featured Analysis, Nana Amasarfo compares the climate tax provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act to how Australia and Canada are handling climate taxation issues. On the opinions page, Robert Goulder examines the debate in the UK over taxing windfall profits in the energy sector. Robert Goulder also discusses the challenges brought on by underfunding the IRS with Professors William Vandenberg and Philip Harmelink. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here is Taxton's Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Spin. Thanks, Paige. I'm here with Fernanda Katsias, a counselor at the Brazilian Administrative Tax and Customs Court of Appeal. Welcome to the podcast, Fernanda. Hello, Jasper. Thanks for having me. Yes, our pleasure. So we're here to discuss your Tax Notes International article titled, Brazil-U.S. Trade Agreement, a New Chapter for Trade Facilitation, which you co-authored with your colleague, Leonardo Branco. Could you give us a brief overview of that article, please? Sure. As you mentioned, my article was written by me and Leonardo, who is a dear colleague and works with me at the Brazilian Administrative Tax and Customs Court of Appeal. And the article focused on the trade facilitation protocol to the U.S.-Brazil Agreement on Trade and Economic Cooperation that we commonly known as the acronym ATEC. Uh, this protocol was signed in uh, last year in the end of Trump's administration, but it just entered in force last June when Brazil finished the treaty ratification process. And 
it is a very important protocol for us, mainly for Brazil. I think uh, U.S. has other similar documents signed before, but this is unprecedented for Brazil. And its importance lies uh, on the fact that although there are other trade facilitation treaties in force, such as the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement and the World Customs Organization Kyoto Revised Convention, in this case specifically, there are more prescriptive provisions demanding effective implementation of rules on fa uh, trade facilitation. If I have to uh, say it in other words, it means that we have here a more concrete commitment, and for that, it would play an active role in the customs modernization in Brazil. So we have something that we can expect more practical outcomes here. Well, thank you, Fernanda. We appreciate that overview. And you certainly highlighted the importance of the agreement. But what inspired you specifically to write this article? Besides being a counselor at the Brazilian Administrative Tax and Customs Court of Appeal, I am also an international trade consultant. And trade facilitation measures are a big part of my work. Also, it was the object of my PhD thesis. And thus, I have been monitoring all the developments in this front for some years. And as soon as the protocol entered in force, Leonardo and I decided to write about it. Although I have to give him the credit for sending the article to be published by you at Tax Notes. Very nice. And we certainly appreciate you both for taking the time to write it and to send it to us. So before we let you go, where can our listeners find you online? Well, I think for both of us, me and Leonardo, the easiest way is LinkedIn. And also, as part of the Brazilian Tax and Customs Court of Appeal, all of our rulings and our uh, CV uh, is at the official website of the court, which is carf, C -A -R -F .gov .br. Thank you, Fernanda. So we certainly appreciate you again joining us on the podcast today. Thank you very much for having me and for the opportunity to talk a little bit about this matter that I think is very important for Brazil. And for listeners, you can find Fernanda and Leonardo's article online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Notes, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy. Again, that's Tax Notes with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at taxstu, that's S-T-E-W. And be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.